So welcome to the panel discussion on Alexander Skoldov's 1967 Soviet film, The Commissar, which is hosted by Manchester University's Center for Jewish Studies. A few words on the Center for Jewish Studies. It's one of seven European centers of excellence in Jewish studies, and it organizes public events such as the Bokhtan of Lectures on the Holocaust and the Sherman Conversations on topics in Jewish studies, gender studies, and the Holocaust. Research specialisms of its members include interfaith relations, the comparative study of genocide, and Jewish Arab identities in the modern Middle East. Our screening and panel discussion today form part of a short public online film series on Jews in the Eastern Bloc, in which Askaldov's Commissar, with its depiction of Jewish life in Ukraine, its Holocaust references, and subsequent history of prohibition form a particularly salient example. We warmly welcome our panelists who have taken on the challenging task to speak to us today in the face of Russia's current horrendous war on Ukraine. Our panelists are Joe Andrew, who is Emeritus Professor of Literature and Culture at Kiel University, where he taught Russian literature and language for many years before setting up a degree in film studies. He has published over 25 books and numerous articles, reviews, and translations on topics including 19th and 20th century Russian literature, Russian and British film, including Askoldov's Commissar. Marit Greenberg is Associate Professor of Russian and Humanities at Reed College. He emigrated from Ukraine in 1993, studied at the Jewish Theological Seminary and Columbia University, New York, and received his PhD from the University of Chicago. A scholar of Jewish and Russian literature and cinema, he has published on Oskoldov's Commissar, the Russian poet Boris Slutsky, and Woody Allen. His new book on Soviet Jewish literature, culture and identity is forthcoming in the autumn. Dr. Elena Yeko is program manager for the an initiative for the study of Ukrainian Jewry at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. She is currently working on a digital resource for Ukrainian university faculty and students about Jews in Ukraine before, during, and after the Holocaust, a subject she had already begun to explore in her PhD thesis at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And Anna Stanchis is the Al and Malka Green Professor of Yiddish Studies and Director of the Antenenbaum Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto. She has written, among other topics, on Jewish popular culture in the Soviet Union and on Jewish life under Stalin. She co-created and co-directed the Grammy-nominated Yiddish Glory Project, which unearthed forgotten Yiddish music written during the Holocaust in the Soviet Union. She is currently working on a book about Yiddish music created in Nazi-occupied Ukraine. So welcome to our panelists and thank you very much for joining us today. We would like to invite all members of the audience to send in your questions. And you can do this by opening the Q&A window, typing your question into the Q&A box and clicking send. This allows you to send your question directly to the panelists and we hope that we can address as many questions as possible. So um, I would like to start by asking um, Elena, perhaps, um, what was the political climate in the Soviet Union when Askoldov's film was made? It was his first and, and his last film, and it has suffered quite an extraordinary fate. So how did this come about? Thank you, Kathy, and thanks again for the invitation uh, to be on this panel. So the film was uh, created at a, a fairly interesting time at the tail end of the thaw in the Soviet Union. So the thaw was a period of de-Stalinization and also a relaxation of censorship and rep repression um, and just relative cultural liberalization as well. Um, so, the film is a product of that environment, but also it's just on the edge of a transition to, um, to more of a, a, a censored and a kind of repressed system. And I think that's reflected also in, in the release. 
Yeah. And what were the particular Soviet discussions about Jewish history and culture at the time? Uh, that That's a great question. And um, on the surface, there aren't discussions, official discussions about these subjects, um, because this is um, just not an I think we've lost uh, Elena there for a moment uh, and uh... An after several years of really, in, uh, really interesting cultural pieces. So in 1961, you have Yevtushenko um, coming out with Baba Yar. Um, the next year you have Shostakovich writing the Baba Yar Symphony. Um, and then just a year before, uh, a year before the film's almost release, um, you also had uh, Anatoly Kuznetsov's um, novel about Baba Yar. So there's definitely at the cultural level, a discussion about Jews and the Holocaust in particular. Thank you. Um, Joe and Anna, you have both written about some of the literary precursors um, of the film, uh, and perhaps you could talk a little bit about that. What were the literary sources? Uh, Elena has already touched a little bit on the literary context of the time, but what were the specific literary uh, sources that Askoldov drew on when he made uh, the film? Maybe Joe, um, maybe you would like to start? Yeah. Uh, well, as as was uh, I think publicised on the poster, the original story by Grossman published it back in the nineteen thirties in the town of Berdichev, as he called it Berdichev, as, as it now is known in Ukrainian. That forms the core of the story of the commissar, female commissar, obviously becoming pregnant, having the baby, being billeted with the Jewish family, the Magazanis. But uh, as called of I think decided to enrich the text, if I could put it that way, by adding quite a lot of motifs and other ideas from uh, Isaac Babiel's Canarmia or Red Cavalry, which was a series of altogether around 30 stories published throughout the 1920s, set during the period of the, the, the Russian Civil War, post-revolution 1918, right through to the early 20s. And the action of this film, as, as we've all now seen, is set in, in the early 1920s as the Civil War still rumbled on. And in, in particular, the, the, the very important dialogue between Yefim Magazanik and Klavya Vavilova, the, the commissar towards the end about the, the good international, as the, the subtitle has it, or the, the international of kindness, that's lifted from one of the, the Babel stories. So I think um, Askoldiv was quite creative in using a source text and adapting it relatively faithfully, but then enriching it with these other ideas and motifs. Thank you. Um, Anna, what about uh, Vasily Grossman? Uh, we have already heard a little bit about Vasily Grossman, but maybe you would like to talk a bit more about uh, the extent to which um, Askoldiv drew on Grossman's story. It was a, sh a short story and he turned it into a full feature film. Yeah, um, so uh, I, um, as any filmmaker who works with uh, literary sources for adaptation, he took a little bit of a story, got in, uh, you know, but there's a lot in the film that uh, is not necessarily in uh, Grossman's uh, message. And I think uh, it's interesting to watch it as a, a nod or as a message to Soviet viewers of the time. So a lot of things pop in there that, uh, especially interesting, you know, those iconic imagery of those kids, naked kids standing and watching uh, the army wagon or whatever it's called going by, for example, uh, you know, and you can see that those boys are circumcised, uh, for example, like that's not in the Grossman story, but that is such an important uh, 
image from the film because uh, I was also watching it with you a little bit and thinking, oh my God, they would never show things like this on today's, uh, you know, uh, screen, let alone TV, but even uh, uh, even in movies. So <clears throat> there's a lot of, um, you know, there, so but you know, to come back to this, so circumcised boys, huge deal. Then this grandma who uh, prays for reasons that are not exactly clear to a layman in, in Yiddish. And it's not that she is praying any actual prayer, like there are all sorts of prayers that Jewish prayers that women say in Yiddish, but she's saying none of that. She's just saying, may my kids, if the, the kids be healthy and, the, and uh, uh, grow up uh, safe and things like this uh, without any reference to God. Like that's also not from Grossman, but that is something that uh, the generation of uh, people like Grossman, so people born before the war, people who went for the war, and then people who come back for it as, Jew, to, as Jews full with guilt, full with unbearable sadness of uh, the loss of their families, impossibility of talking about Holocaust or what happened to them. So that grandma is talking to them and it ignores all the adaptation stuff and she's talking to them, to the viewers, they don't understand what she's saying, but the sound reminds them of the grandmas who, like her who died in Berdichev and who this generation never got to say goodbye to. So I think there's a lot of autobiographical things in Grossman uh, in, in this uh, film uh, from Grossman's life and some of it from the story, but to me, the whole like message of it is more interesting of what is it saying to this to, to this generation mm -hmm. yeah um Marit, i was wondering if you could say a bit more actually about the film's thematic but also its aesthetic innovations because aesthetically and especially uh the sound um is quite striking yeah, thank you. And <clears throat> thank you again for organizing the event. And, and it's wonderful to be on the panel with uh, friends and, and colleagues. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the film, you know, made in 66, 67, was released only 20 years uh, later. Uh, but it has weathered the time really well from, from a number of per perspectives. Uh, uh, and, and I think it has only become more re relevant in terms of uh, the horror that we're witnessing today in Ukraine. Um, and aesthetically, it, it has withstood the test of time well. And, uh, you know, Askoldov, it's his first film and it's his only film. Uh, you know, he was, he was trying to make another film for decades, you know, after that, but, ne but never managed to. And, you know, when I uh, interviewed him for my book on, on Commissar in 20, 2015, he still talked to me about the fact that he is working on this film and cannot, cannot uh, uh, find... Uh, uh, you know, funding for it. Um, you know, the the kind of the cinematographic aesthetic is is, is very complex and unique on the one hand, uh, but also clearly in dialogue uh, with a squad of predecessors. There's a very interesting, uh, and I think Joe Andrew has written about that. There's a very interesting kind of polemical dialogue with Eisenstein and the earlier school of Soviet cinema. Eisenstein, uh, Dovzhenko, uh, a number of other uh, a number of other figures. Um, but also the film is very much in dialogue with a whole body of work on revolution and civil war in Soviet, in, in Soviet cinema. And, you know, in many respects, you know, uh, uh, Askoldov borrows uh, from those films, again, in dialogue with them. On the other hand, he's doing something radically, radically different. And, and we can touch on that uh, uh, a, little, a little later. Uh, I mean, just to mention one thing, for instance, uh, this is probably, I, I never like to say the only, but I really think this is the only uh, Soviet film about you know, civil war that does not feature the enemy, right? Uh, it is, we, we have these two kind of solipsistic yeah. universes, the Jewish one uh, and, the, and the red one, yeah, represented by, uh, by Vavilova, but there are no whites, right? Uh, there, there, there is no, uh, there are no other enemies. In the, in the procession scene, right, when Vavilova has her vision of Jews walking into what appears to be a, a death camp, a concentration camp, they're walking on their own volition. There are no Germans. Of course, we do know, right, that there are, there are enemies all around, but they're never shown. They're never visible. And it's a really interesting, uh, interesting uh, 
you know, a uh, step on, on Askordov's part. Um, so yeah, I think cinematographically it's complex. Uh, it's, it, it's still very, uh, very interesting. And again, on the one hand, kind of with dialogue with so much in, in Soviet cinema, but also Western cinema. And on the other hand, Askordov is doing something that is, um, that is unique and, and original. Mm -hmm why why uh, why this absence of of the enemy uh how, how how would you explain that uh well the way that i interpret it in in my book on the film is that you know he is really in, invested uh as Gordon, that is in 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 this project of exploring jewishness on the one hand right uh uh, mythologically, historically, and on the other hand, exploring kind of the red zone, the revolutionary zone, the Soviet zone, also mythologically, poetically, uh, historically, right? He is, he sort of, he looks at these two incompatible universes that do merge throughout the film, of course, because of Babilova becomes part of the family, but at the same time, they actually, I think, never sort of merge, and we really see it in the birth scene, right? She's giving birth, and that's what the Jewish family sees, but there is this kind of apocalyptic thing that's happening outside of all of that, right? So I think he is, that's what he is really interested in, right? It's not even so much a historical vision as kind of sort of, you know, approaching the Jewish world, the rev revolutionary world uh, as these two kind of mythological, uh, you know, mythological uh, entities. And, and it's very interesting, again, yeah, we can touch on that later, but, you know, Askoldev, and this is what marked him apart as, uh, uh, you know, Elaine talked about the thaw period and, and how the film does fit into it to, you know, to, to a large extent. At the same time, Askoldev was also very, very different from many of the filmmakers who became prom writers, you know, intellectuals who became prominent during the thaw, because Askoldev was actually a firm believer in the justice of the revolution. Uh, and, you know, he thought, he believed it was corrupted during the 1930s, during the you know, period of Stalinist terror. Uh, he was also somebody who thought that any war, including civil war, was horrific. But at the same time, he was absolutely invested in the ideals, in the ideals of the revolution, right? And, and when the film finally you know, uh, was released in 87 and then shown abroad, particularly you know, in the United States in 1988 in San Francisco, other places, and Ascolde was interviewed by, by American journalists uh, who were asking him, you know, all, all sorts of things. And then he began to talk about Lenin and Marx and, and kind of, and the ideals of the revolution. And they were dumbfounded, right? What is this guy who was a, a victim of Soviet censorship? What is he doing there, sitting there and talking about, and talking about the revolution? Um, and, and that's, you know, that's a score. And, and kind of, we, we have to take him with all the pluses and, and kind of minuses of his complex uh, personality. I don't know if any of the other panelists would like to to jump in and and respond or or extend. Yes, if I may, uh, Kathy, just that very last point. Uh, there's very interesting things that Marat was just saying uh, about Askoldov's position, a member of the party. He wasn't, in that sense, a dissident, although he, he suffered grievously. You might almost say, you know, this is a very tragic film for him because there's you and others have already pointed out, it was to be his only film. But when we look look within the film, what, what is the film saying about the revolution? I entirely agree with Marat that the ending, although somewhat controversial, both within the film itself, as we see in Yefim Magazani's reaction to Bavira ab 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 abandoning her baby, and, and some commentators have also seen it as a sign of her inhumanity. But I scold have both said, and I think, uh, textually, this is justified that uh, Vavida was doing the right thing because she believed in the revolution and it was worth going back to it to fight for it, to safeguard her her son's future and the Magazanik's future. And that's why the, the proto-Holocaust scene is so important. And, and I think Askoldov was very much a, a believer in the revolution in, in exactly the same way that Marat's just described. And that is so too within the film itself. If I could just add, I think, you know, uh, uh, regarding, uh, you know, regarding this point, and if we look at the documents, uh, you know, the first uh, reactions to the film on the part of the censors, on the part of the, you know, the editors, uh, my apologies, um, 
And what really bothered them from the get-go when they just, you know, for the, uh, so, so the script was not just the Jewish element, which, you know, was completely sort of dumbfounding to them, but also the depiction of Vavilova as this brutal commissar, right? And, and we see it in, in, in the initial, you know, scene in the film where she orders to shoot the deserter, right? And, and he falls and his milk spills. Uh, this is something the censor said, get rid of it, right? Uh, at this point, we no longer want to present the revolution, kind of the brutal face of the revolution, right? We need a much more humane face, uh, but Escolda would not go for it. Yeah, so in fact, I do think, right? So yes, absolutely, he is horrified by the violence of the war and, he, and the film condemns it. On the other hand, I think he also recognizes the justice in this, uh, in this revolutionary, uh, you know, in this revolutionary cause. And, and um, yeah, and here it's also interesting in terms of comparing to, to Grossman, but we can, we can come back to that. Yeah. Anna. So, you know, it's interesting to think about this uh, as a film about revolution. Uh, and uh, I think that's, uh, that's fair, but I'm also going to say that although the film is about revolution, the film is actually about the Holocaust. And if we start looking into this from this perspective, this whole Vavilova leaving the baby has nothing to do with Leninist views of Askolda, but has everything to do with the Red Army, with this whole sacrifice of people who are leaving those uh, family members behind to fight for, um, you know, families like um, uh, the one that gave Vavilova um, a refuge. So if we switch gears like that a little bit, then suddenly Vavilova's humanity become, goes to the next level. This whole like, you know, Mother Mary thing, sacrificing Jesus so that people can live. And, um, you know, uh, and I think that reading of, uh, of that film it's very different. Like Grossman, what does he care about all that? Like when he wrote that story, it was not his story at all. But I think that film for the viewers that were going to see it in the 60s but never got to see it, uh, this was a story about that. And those hints about uh, later destruction are very important. And um, I also think, I'm not sure, but uh, I keep thinking about the trauma of this generation of. Uh, men and also women who lost all these babies. And, you know, if we start thinking about demographic losses of Soviet Jews during the Holocaust, people in the army are a lot safer than people who are civilians. And that's a, you know, fairly unique Jewish experience during the war because usually it's more dangerous to serve in the army than to remain a civilian, but not for Jews. And the survival rate of places like Berdichev is less than 1%. So they'll say, as you know, a monastery they show and stuff, this was where the ghetto was, that, that's where Vasily Grossman's mother was killed. And uh, more or less, you know, Jews of Berdichev who survived the war were not from Berdichev. They were, most of Jews of Berdichev were killed in August. And I'm sure Askoldov is 100% aware of that. Uh, and um, I think that's the story that he, he wanted to tell. Because I keep thinking, like, why do a story about Russian Revolution so much in 1967? I mean, uh, maybe. But I think I think there is a, another pressing issue. And, uh, and I think uh, we all know, agree that that's why uh, that this film did not uh, make it to the viewers. Although what Marat, you're saying about the lack of uh, humanity in Vavilova is being one of the reasons that the censorship didn't like it is also very interesting. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, Elena, I don't know if you wanted to, uh, to add something to this. Yeah, um, just to add to what Anna was saying about trauma and the loss of children. I think you see that in the film through just the, the kind of trauma that the children are continually reenacting as they're playing. Um, and then of course, in, in, the, in the worst scene when they're having the second play acting and there's the allusion to rape um, as well as the children turning on themselves. Yeah, thank you. We actually have some some audience questions that that sort of chime with the discussion right now. Uh, one is, for example, uh, precisely about the children. Uh, the question is uh, the children becoming prone to and acting out violence due to what they see in civil war, threat of self-hate or not, in invoking pejorative yid when kids were torturing the little girl. I think the question here is about 
maybe also to what extent there are images of Jewish self-hatred in the film, if I understand it correctly. I don't know if any of you want to, want to take up that question. Marit? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's an interesting and difficult, uh, and difficult question. But if I could just go back for a little bit to what Anna was saying, uh, uh, and I would uh, absolutely agree. Uh, and I think in fact, Ascolda would, would, would have agreed that this is very much a film uh, about the Holocaust. As well as I think it is, it is very much for him also a film about the revolutionary um, uh, legacy. And uh, you know, in this regard, it's interesting. Of course, if Grossman's story in the town of Birdichev, right? Uh, the film was shot in in Kaminspadilsky, uh, and it was deliberate choice on the part of uh, on the part of Askoldov. He had very interesting connection to the town, the town where I happen to have been born, uh, and. This is the place, this is the, the town where the first large massacre uh, of Jews by the Nazis took place even before Babin Yar in, uh, uh, in Kiev. And there's some really interesting uh, things about you know, where he shot the, the, the scene of the procession to the camp and, and how, anyway, we can, we, can, uh, we can come back to that. Uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the children, again, that scene, you know, the scene where the, the kids are reenacting a pogrom and in fact, you know, there's kind of a symbolic rape uh, of their of their sister. Again, this was something that the censors said remove. This, this absolutely must uh, must go, and he would not and he would not agree. I do not see that that scene as an example of uh, as an example of self hatred. Uh, of course, you know, there right, these Jewish Jewish boys are reenacting anti Semitic violence, right? But I think kind of what Askolda was saying, the only time when kind of the Jew becomes violent is when he is pretending to be a non-Jew, right? Who directs his violence, uh, violence against you. And that uh, scene that Anna talked about, right? Where we have the boys, you know, frolicking and the sister in the, in, in the bath, right? And, and the mother washes them. And then you have this Tatyanka, the symbol of the revolution, the main weapon of the civil war passing through very much a phallic symbol, right? And then we have these, you know, genitalia, circumcised genitalia of these Jewish boys, it's quite clear that kind of the, the, that violence, the violence of the weapon threatens, uh, threatens the Jewish body. Um, so I, I don't think there are elements of, of self-hatred, but I would also just one more thing to add, Askoldov clearly had a very difficult relationship with his own Jewishness. His father was Jewish. He never acknowledged that. He never acknowledged it to his dying day. Uh, and so it's it's fascinating, right? Somebody who made this really the only post-war Soviet film about Jews, explicit film about Jews, uh, also concealed the fact that he was uh, that he was Jewish, uh, and it's uh, and it's 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 complicated. Yeah, Anna, but could it be that um, concealing the fact that he is Jewish makes the story more universal and relevant? That's a lot of those writers were thinking about because the second you say a Jewish and write about Jews, forget it. Like you're talking to, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> self-selected audience. Uh, I don't know, but you know, I wanted to address that question about self-hate. I think Marat answered all of that. I just want to add that it was very common for uh, people to call each other Yids or Jids. Uh, just they were repeating whatever they heard on the street and Jews lived in this society where, uh, you know, this is how, um, if you wanted to offend someone, this is what you will say. And it's not just, uh, it didn't just refer to Jews, you know, non-Jews called each other that if they wanted to offend them. So those kids doing that is actually, well, it's funny for us uh, to watch, but that's nothing to do with self-hate. Uh, self-hate is a whole different story. Uh, Joe. Yes, just to pick up a couple of the fascinating points that Marat and uh, Anna have been making um, ab about uh, Askoldov's own relationship with his own Jewishness. And I mentioned earlier on uh, one of his sources, which is Akbabil, and you find the same kind of tension in the very autobiographical main narrator of the Red Army stories, Lyutov, who never fully kind of acknowledges his, his own Jewishness. He's both fascinated by the, the Jewish characters he, he meets, but also repelled by their, their, their certain aspects of their, what he perceives to be weakness. And I think Askoldov 
whether consciously or unconsciously, very much as it were, channels Lutup and, and Barbiel. Um, just going right back to the very beginning of what we said about the context and what is this film about the revolution or about the Holocaust? Well, obviously it's about both. But one very important fact, fact that we've so far overlooked is the film was made in one sense as, as uh, an anniversary film. 1967, of course, was the 50th anniversary, a major anniversary, a jubilee of the revolution. So to make something so ambivalent about revolutionary goals, or maybe not so much ambivalent, but not clear cut enough when it was for the 50th anniversary was what, yet another nail in Ascoltus Films' coffin. But clearly, as it was made in 1967 for 1917, we must see it as being centrally about the revolution. Yeah, and I mean, 1967 is, is kind of an important year in so many, in so yeah. many different ways. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, Elena, if you'd like to talk about about that, maybe um, the 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 global context and the uh, Israeli context and its its impact on the reception of the film. Um. Uh, sure. So in 1967, you have Israel's Six Day War against its Arab neighbors, and the Soviet Union um, very much comes down on the side of the Arabs in that conflict. And from that point then, at least at the, the state level in the Soviet Union, you have kind of a, a doubling down on state anti-Semitism, which at the time is, um, is presented as anti-Zionism. Um, so Zionism is presented as, as a very racist, uh, a, a racist movement with imperial ambitions. Uh, and there's also uh, Soviet anti-Zionists uh, sort of link up a whole host of kind of stereotypical anti-Jewish um, ideas with that concept as well. And that, that directly also yeah. led to the ban of, of the film, didn't it? Um, I think Marat, you've written about that. Yes, Marat. Um. Yeah, and and just to go back, I you know the film in a sense was was even sort of commissioned, you know, to coincide with the 50th anniversary uh, of of the revolution, right? As Ascorda was kind of choosing, that was that was essentially kind of his his diploma film, right? His kind of final project after he finished the screenwriters uh, courses at uh, Moscow Film Institute, um, and. Um, but you know, yes, 1967, of course, as Elena said, the 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 Six Day War, which uh, leads to breaking diplomatic relations between Israel and the Soviet Union, and certainly huge increase in kind of official anti-Semitism. Uh, that's on the one hand, uh, and so that did not help with the film being released. Although I think it would not have been released even had the you know Six Day War happened not in 67, but whatever in 68 or 69. Uh, but on the other hand, the Six Day War played an enormous role in bolstering uh, the sense of Jewishness among Soviet Jews, right? And, and so there are some interesting, uh, uh, you know, kind of archival tidbits that we have when the film was, uh, was discussed at the studio, uh, Trauberg, major Soviet filmmaker who was, uh, you know, Askordov's teacher and, and mentor and, and very much wanted to help him, he stood up and he said, you know, I don't want to see a, a film about kind of sad Jewish fate. I want to see a film about the revolution. And the way that this usually has been interpreted is that Trauberg, who was a victim of anti-cosmopolitan campaign, you know, under, under Stalin, uh, he was scared, right? And he sort of kind of what he said fits into that new anti-Semitic, anti anti-Zionist policy. I see it differently. You know, I actually, I actually, you know, when he says, I, do, I don't want to see a film about sad Jewish fate, uh, what he's thinking about is the Israeli victory and the Jewish victory, right? And, uh, and, and that sense that, look, Jews can fight and they can fight really well uh, was widespread among, again, Soviet Jews, but also general population, Soviet, Soviet intelligentsia, right? So, so it's, 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 it's sort of complicated, yeah? Because of course, yeah, as sort of, I think, take on kind of Jewish history, mythologically speaking, he may very much sees it as kind of this, lacrimose sort of tradition, right? This unending, unending tragedy. Uh, and, uh, and the Israeli victory, uh, you know, in 1967 showed a very different image of the Jew. 
Um, so once again, I mean, it's these different kind of interesting complex contexts uh, that surround the, the production of the film. Yeah, one of the film's uh, striking elements is is the kind of performance element, the dance and uh, and song, which I think seems to stand on the kind of the cusp of both. It's 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 the sentimental lachrymose conception of the Jew, but the Jew who also remains joyful somehow in some way uh, in, in the face of atrocity. Um, we, we actually have an audience question about um, the role of dance and the performing arts in the, in the film and whether there's been done any work, uh, more concerted work on that. I don't know if any of you would like to speak on that. Yeah, Anna? short answer is no work no. i mean when you start thinking about the state of on dance unless marat knows something that i don't but uh i think uh it's it's it, i've been thinking a lot about dance actually when it comes to uh jewish performances in the soviet union like what are they dancing exactly uh and uh at first i thought maybe they like repeating from some yiddish films uh, from the 30s, and then I read a very interesting study by Zehavit Stern explaining all the dances like in Dubuk, and she says, well, actually, those dances are all like African dances and modernist dances because the choreographer was like, so excited about bringing that culture to Yiddish film, and then, of course, now we watch that Dubuk and think, oh, this is authentic Jewish dance, so uh, if anyone who has gone to a Jewish wedding, you know, people don't dance like that, they barely dance, but you know what I mean, like, so this is uh, definitely not reflecting any kind of um, authentic experience. But what I do think it, it does reflect, it's kind of like, oh, how do I translate this? Uh, not into English, but into culturally. Like, so there's this whole tradition of professional folk dancing in Russia, Russian, Ukrainian, Moldovan, it's a very big deal. And uh, people, it's like, think of it as Russian ballet, but difficult, but different kind of genre. And uh, I think these uh, choreographers, professional choreographers, imagining how it would look for Jews so you can actually watch that and as opposed to just uh, participate in this. So I think they create this sort of artificial Jewish dance from the point of view or with the aesthetic sensibilities of the Russian audience. And that's what we see on the screen. But uh, that's just my hypothesis. I don't know if I'm right. Yeah, uh, Joe, and then Marat. Yeah, this is actually a question for my fellow panelists. And uh, in rewatching the film uh, over the last couple of weeks, and as well as again this evening, Fiddler on the Roof very much kind of came into my mind. I don't know exactly what the the chronology is there, but Fiddler on the Roof was just uh, emerging in at the same time as this film, and it of course is set very much in the same geographical area, and in turn is based on a series of of Jewish stories yeah, by Shalom Aleichem. But I wonder if anybody knows whether Askoldov knew of Fiddler on the Roof or the work on it. Yeah, Mara? Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think the exact year when Fiddler on the Roof comes out. It's what, 60? Well, the film was not, was 71. But film is 71. Of course, there are Broadway productions, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and he would not, he could not have known about the Broadway productions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Right, and so okay, the film is the film is seventy one. Um, you know, I I discussed the dance scene extensively in, in my in my book on the film, but I would absolutely agree with Anna. It, it is not an authentic whatever the authentic means in this context, but it's not an authentic representation of a, of a Jewish dance, right? Uh, it's I mean, it's this kind of finger finger movement that was really an invention of Bukov, right? Who plays Yefim, who so much in the film is an invention of Bukov, you know, who was a, a, a great director in his own right, and of course a great, a great actor in his own, uh, in his own right. Uh, and it's interesting, Anna mentioned the Dibok, I very much see the dance as a dance macabre, right, as a dance of death, kind of this absurdist, as you said, uh, uh, Kathy, right, it is joyful, but it is absurdist joy, right, it's kind of, yes, we're going to die, but let's sort of die with, you know, smiles on our on our lips. So it is terrifying. And when you look at Vavilova, uh, Mardukova's face as she's watching, right, there's this, she's such a great actress, this, you know, minute changes between fear and acceptance and sympathy and understanding and fear uh, and fear again. So it is very much a dance macabre. Uh, and I do write about the link to, to the dance, you know, the death of dance, the famous death of dance uh, in the Dibok. I have no idea if Askoldov, you know, saw the, you know, the 37 Polish 
uh, Polish Yiddish film. He could have, I mean, he could have, but who knows. But what I do argue is that there are intuitive links, right? He almost kind of intuitively picks up uh, uncertain, uncertain points, right? Uh, and and yeah, what's so what's so interesting, you know, if you study the script, the literary script that he wrote, uh, how drastically different it is uh, from the film, and particularly that dance scene. In you know, in the script, it is yeah, he sort of you know, the father just wants to comfort his his children, and they kind of begin begin to dance. Whereas uh, uh, in in the film, it's probably my favorite scene. It is this absolutely kind of terrifying. Uh, 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 you know, uh, moment, which of course then leads into the Holocaust vision that Vavilova, uh, that Vavilova has. Oh, you know, Marat, maybe it's like linking not to Dibok, Dibok is maybe too far-fetched, but what about all these Soviet films like Jewish Luck of 1925, Absolutely. you know, what's Absolutely. his name, Roland Bikov, he looks exactly like uh, Mikhoyl's uh, this, Absolutely. Uh, yes. you know, and I think uh, we haven't talked about this, but maybe it should be said that there is some influence of Yiddish theater tradition here. Like I cannot not see it. Uh, I'm trying to tell myself that I shouldn't look for it because you know, parallel cultures, but you can't not notice. And I think the dance is actually one of the good examples yeah. of that. Uh, no, I, I agree. I agree com completely. And uh, Mikhoyls, right? The, the, the great uh, Yiddish actor, head of the Moscow Yiddish theater, you know, killed, killed by Stalin, uh, was an incredibly important figure for Askoldov. So Askoldov and both Askoldov and Bikov explicitly had Mikhoyls on their minds. Uh, and the second film that Askoldov was working on that he never finished was a film about Mikhoyls. It was a film about Moscow Yiddish theater. Uh, he wrote a novel about it and uh, which he published only in the German translation. He never published it in Russian. Uh, but that was supposed to be the second film. That would have been the you know, film about, about Mikhoyls. And so this kind of Chaplin-esque manner, the tramp, you know, walk that, of course, uh, uh, you know, kind of Mihoyles took from Chaplin, and then that's transferred, uh, you know, transferred to uh, Bukov, uh, you know, in playing in playing Yefim. So, absolutely, I think uh, you know, Yiddish Yiddish theater, Moscow Yiddish theater tradition is 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 very significant for the film. Yeah, and and there there are the there's obviously the Jewish uh, theme in the film, but the, there's also the broader theme of of religion, which probably provides sort of one of the dissident moments in the film, if one can say that. But um, one thing that's that's striking, especially uh, in the context of the Jewish themes in the film, is, is the, the prevalence of Christian themes, which which seem to interact in, in interesting ways, let's say, with the with the Jewish themes. Uh, there's a question here from the audience about um, the, the, quest, the Christian themes and whether uh, Vavilova herself is is shown to be kind of drawn to Christianity at that moment where she is um, surveying the the ruins I think it's a ru ruins of a synagogue that she's looking at isn't she um, but she did she did approach uh, a church before that so uh, and it's it's it seems to be suggested that she's maybe thinking about having the baby baptized do you agree with that? That's the, the question. Could it be that she was looking to have the baby baptized? Yeah. Um, it, it's, you know, I mean, the, that scene, so the, the procession, right? Yes. Yeah, so we, we don't see her stopping at the Orthodox church. We see the Orthodox church in the distance. Uh, and then, of course, she sees a Catholic priest and she stops by the, uh, you know, by the Catholic cathedral. And then she goes to the ruins uh, ruins of the synagogue. So it is very much kind of this ecumenical vision, right? And again, Askoldov talked explicitly about that. Uh, I think there are absolutely Christological elements in the film. Uh, again, you know, the way that he presents the Jewish family, it is very much kind of a holy family. And the names, Maria, these are not the names that we have in Grossman's story. Uh, you know, uh, Bailey is, is the, is the uh, you know, wife's name in, in the town of Berdichev, right? But it's Maria, clearly. You know the mother of God comes to comes to mind, and of course Vavilova is presented. I would say is kind of this red Madonna, right? And and then her child is this kind of messianic messianic baby, uh, a product a product of the revolution. Uh, and um, yeah, but anyway, I don't want to dominate. The, but but I think the, the the scene in the synagogue is particularly is particularly interesting. I also want to say that um, you know. It's 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 a mistake maybe to 
talk about Judaism and Christianity in the Soviet context, because there's no such thing as Judaism per se, you know, it's urban religion and both Jews and Christians more or less share the same beliefs and this uh, uh, Christianity as a religion or as a philosophical system is a lot closer to most urban Jews than uh, Judaism, which they barely know and have uh, uh, you know, contact with and all this. So the names, are, so the family is Jewish, but I agree with Marat, the, their lifestyle and their story is definitely Christian. And that does not make it, just to <laughs> answer and answer and ask questions, does not make it self-hate. It does not make it, uh, um, I don't know, somehow less Jewish. It's just Jewish the way it makes sense in the Soviet context. And uh, uh, I think the film really uh, kind of makes that clear what it, what it looks like. I think, Joe, you looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, sure, yeah, just picking up uh, Marat's point about uh, Favila as, as the Red Madonna, I think that's a, an excellent phrase. And, and I think we see that from the very beginning of the film, that the first kind of real striking image is of the wayside Madonna, very much a kind of Mater Dolorosa figure, uh, sort of the sorrowful virgin as well. And although we only realise this later on, when we hear her singing in person, the, 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 the song in the background as the army is uh, going round the Madonna is Vavila singing to her child. You know, so retrospectively, she's very much identified with that statue. Yeah, great. Uh, Elena, did you want to add something to that particular point? Um, Marat, you had another. Yeah, I just, because I, I think that, you know, the scene in the synagogue is, is so interesting. And again, that has to do with the specific topography of Communist Podilsky, that you know, uh, the city, one of the most actually all the cities in Europe in general, right? I mean, the, the fortress dating back to you know the 13th century and it was under different rules throughout uh, throughout history. Uh, and so the, the the synagogue that Vavilo walks into, uh, it was bombed. It was one of the largest synagogues in the city prior to you know prior to the war. It was bombed during World War II. Uh, and we see scaffolding right on it. And the reason that there is scaffolding is because this, the city was turning it into a restaurant at that mm -hmm. point. And the restaurant, that's how it exists to this, uh, to this very day. But what's interesting is that Askolyov later on begins to make up all these stories about the, that there was a pogrom in this town before the, you know, he started shooting his film, uh, that, that you know, the synagogue was burned and you know, torched and that's why it's in ruins. And, and that goes back to the point that Joe was making earlier about the connection that he felt with Isaac Babel, right? I think he very much kind of was taken that you know, Babelian sort of landscape of the civil war and anti-Jewish violence and transferring it into uh, Soviet Ukraine of 1960s. And despite enormous prevalence of anti-Semitism, there were no pogroms, uh, you know, in 1960s Ukraine. There were acts of vandalism here and there, uh, but I've researched it pretty extensively. Uh, there was nothing uh, like, you know, what he's describing in terms of the, you know, synagogue being, being torched. So again, it's interesting how he bridges these different kind of historical, historical periods to create his very much his own kind of mythological picture where Christianity and Judaism, whatever that meant in the Soviet context is on a set kind of merge and, and sort of feed off each other. Thank you. Uh, we have a question about, about gender uh, before we start wrapping up. Um, the question is about um, the importance of, of female characters in the film and any issues that might, might arise from, from the way in which they portrayed. So the question is typically during wartime when war issues are discussed, women's issues and then Bernard commas become silenced. Um, so yeah, I don't know if any of you would like to take up that question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll start if I may. Um, I, I think, again, I've been thinking about this in rewatching the film that for 1967 in the Soviet Union, the, the, the film is remarkably nuanced around discussion of fem female feminine identity with, uh, and as Yefim uh, says towards the end of the film, you know, if a, a, a woman puts on leather trousers, that doesn't make her a man. And the way that Bavilova, as, as Marat pointed out in a different context earlier, is, is almost hyper-masculine at the beginning, 
very ruthless in, in executing the, the deserter, quite unnecessarily, one might say, and the, the way she's dressed in the great coat and so on. But then as she is slowly feminized and then becomes a mother, a very loving mother. And I think the way the film then uh, resolves these issues towards the end, when she goes back to fight, uh, she's breastfeeding while wearing her great coat. And then as she runs off, she's still wearing the headscarf that she only donned halfway through. So I think the film is really very, very subtle in the way it handles Pavilova's gender identity, counterpointed with Maria and, although only a background figure, with Yefim's mother as well. We have the three gradations of different performances, if, if you like, of being a woman. So, and I, I think the film you know, is really way ahead of its time in certain senses in, in, its, in its feminism, actually. Mara? Yeah, and, and at the same time, I, I'm, I completely agree. Uh, but also, you know, there is a figure of the female commissar in Soviet yeah. mythology of the revolution, uh, Soviet literature, you know, Soviet film. Uh, uh, you know, we can also think about Babi's play, you know, Maria, uh, which also features a, a, female, a female protagonist. But if you think about the earlier representations of the of the uh, kind of woman, uh, 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 women commissars and optimistic tragedy, or if we think about the film 1941, uh, about a love uh, between, uh, uh, you know, a red army uh, warrior, a woman and, and a white officer, uh, those are still very kind of humanistic portraits, right? Uh, and in Vavilova, it's more complex. On the one hand, this Madonna figure, uh, uh, but on the other hand, again, this kind of symbol of the, of the brutality uh, of the revolution, right? And of course, yeah, the fact that she rejoins her troops at the end uh, is so uh, is so significant. Uh, and and it also, it should be said that like, Vavilova also kind of a symbol of uh, kind of this primordial Russian femininity, right? Which uh, uh, we we also see, I think, in Grossman's story to uh, you know to an extent. Thanks. Would anyone like to add to that? I was just thinking that maybe there's this always competing ideas of an ideal woman in the, on the Soviet screen. And in this film, and this whole kind of, uh, uh, is an ideal woman the one who is um, a revolutionary, abandons her family, or is an ideal woman the one who raises that family? And that dichotomy, by the way, is never solved in the Soviet culture ever, because like in the 20s, they tried to say it's a revolutionary woman, but then they abandoned that idea. Uh, and Lenin himself was quite conservative, actually, when it came to women's liberation stories, like famous things he said about Kolontai and stuff like that. So this whole Soviet culture is a fight, uh, is a tension between those two ideas of womanhood. And I think the film portrayed that beautifully. And I think if one teaches gender in Soviet culture, uh, or even post-Soviet culture, and it's like, what's of all this Russian immigrants? You know, like that's uh, that's a very interesting film to watch because uh, that uh, again does not resolve it. You know, who do we sympathize more more with this Maria, this beautiful mom? You know, who raised the six kids in the conditions there she is laughing or <laughs> this uh, Klavdia Vavilova who like didn't notice she was pregnant and uh, then turned into a woman and then became a revolutionary again because of the high ideals. So I think, um, I don't know, like I think uh, it's, uh, it's doesn't, if, <laughs> Askoldov doesn't want us to know what he thinks, just, it's just the portrayal of complexity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree completely completely with what Anna said. And I think I think it's also worth noting that these two representations of women, um, they still seem to respect each other and get along on that individual level. And I think that's really important too. So it's not just the director not making a decision, but it's also um, individual choice and circumstances that come. Um, with with that still kind of relationship and respect. And what are the the resonances of of watching the film right now in this current historical moment? Um, I was wondering if any of you wanted to share some thoughts on that. Yeah, Marat. 
Um, yeah, I mean, first I wanted to say that, uh, you know, Askoldov was tied to Ukraine uh, can, tremendously. You know, he was born in Moscow, but he spent his childhood and youth in Kyiv. Uh, his father was a very prominent figure in the city and you know, was arrested in 1937 and, uh, and killed. And, uh, uh, you know, Raisa Nidashkovska, who plays, who plays Maria, is a Ukrainian actress, the only one still surviving from the, uh, from the cast. Uh, and, you know, when I talked to Askoldov in 20, 2015, when the war already started in Eastern Ukraine, of course, with the annexation of Crimea, he told me how devastated he was by all of that. And that he was just, I think, you know, if he now watches from wherever he is and, and sees what's happening, he, 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 I don't know how he could have, how he could bear, you know, uh, seeing, uh, seeing this war. So in that respect, you know, that, yeah, considering Askoldov's ties, uh, ties to Ukraine. Also, I was, I was teaching the film this semester in two of my courses, in the course on global Jewish cinema and in the course on Soviet auteur cinema. And, and watching it this time, particularly thinking of the cellar scene, right, where we have this dialogue between Vavilova and, and, you know, and, and Yefim as they're listening to the, to the bombing above. I mean, it's, it's absolutely horrifying. And, and just, and for me, again, personally, you know, this is coming in Spadorsky, the city where, where I was, I grew up with stories by my grandparents about how they saw all these great stars come to the city, you know, for, for, for the film. And, and again, witnessing everything, it's just such a horrendously sad and, and, and bizarre uh, picture, which at the same time, as I said, makes the film very relevant uh, in, this, in, this, in this context, yeah. Anyone else? What really strikes me about the film in relation to the current war is, um, is the children, really. So, you know, we hear from Ukrainian adults on different news programs or through our own uh, social networks, but we mostly see images of the children who are being affected by this war. And I think, um, what I really appreciated in the film today is just how, how it shows the experiences of children. Um, again, the hiding in the cellar that Marat mentioned, but also just the kind of violence they're exposed to and the things they hear and the things they pick up on. Yeah. Joe? I, there's nothing really I can add to that. I, I think, um, the, 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 we uh, discussed earlier the the um, the way the film touches on th three or four different periods of, of Soviet Russian history: the early nineteen twenties, the nineteen sixties, the nineteen eighties. Tragically, it has become relevant for a fourth, you know, covers a, a yet a fourth period of of post Soviet Russian history in a in a terribly tragic way. Yeah. Anna, <clears throat> Anna, oh. I don't know. All I can say is, um, you know, I agree with what the, my colleagues are saying. All I can say is that watching this film, um, I think watching the news today makes that film somehow more, uh, I don't know, striking or more uh, just like uh, relevant uh, to, to life. So it suddenly switched from a historical film to contemporary helping understand kind of thing. And uh, I think the present sadly helps to understand that past. And suddenly as uh, uh, Marat or Joe was saying like about the film on, uh, about the cellar scene uh, and, uh, and uh, all that stuff, you watch the news and then you watch that and you're just like, oh yeah. And uh, I don't think us cold of would have ever wanted that at all and uh yeah it's it's all i can say and i have to say like going it's not just this film it's just the chronicles of world war ii of scenes of evacuation scenes of draft scenes of family separations all this stuff that we write about and we researched painstakingly now we don't have to do all that because we just turn on the news and every day we hear story expressed with exactly the same words that take place at exactly the same places and uh to me i'm not honestly like i'm too close to it yet I, i'm not ready to kind of give analysis yet so we watch the film and um 
I'm, I'm happy that the film is circulating, but um, yeah, yeah. Our reality does not let us to have distance. We thank you very much for your reflections and for speaking to our audience today. Uh, thanks also to our audience uh, for coming along to this event. And we shall finish here and hopefully carry on our discussions in another, in another way soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>